Hello everyone, my name is Mr. Gentleman, and we are here to do one thing and one thing only, and that is discuss the lost history of early Japanese action RPGs. Within my history of Dragon Quest, I gave a brief history on the origins of RPGs. However, I skimmed over quite a bit of information to focus on the genesis of console-style RPGs. The information in question is the often unheard of sudden boom and subsequent mellowing of action RPGs in Japan. Before we begin, I am aware that there are a few 80s western titles that experimented with combining action mechanics and role-playing elements, but I would like to do a separate video on the history and rise of action RPGs in the west at another time. The formative years of the RPG market in Japan shall be our focus for now. The early years of the genre are rather complex. In actuality, the genesis of action RPGs occurred and created a wave of top-down and side-scrolling games before Dragon Quest debuted, and even that is an oversimplification of what really happened. What I would like to do now is recount the history of the genre to bring us down another one of its many branches to give us an overview of what is an often ignored part of gaming history, and give a survey on what those games were like. The beginning of role-playing games started out at universities on Play-Doh computer terminals, giving us top-down dungeon crawlers. Years later, the work of Richard Garriott on Acalabeth and Ultima, as well as Bob Woodward on Wizardry, would give way to the first-person dungeon crawler that became so popular among computer techies. In the West, developers were interested in a gameplay style that was essentially turn-based as opposed to action titles, due to the desire to replicate the experience of Dungeons & Dragons. But Americans weren't the only ones enjoying these games, as Japanese gamers were highly interested in these titles and enjoyed them greatly. A few companies attempted to create their own dungeon crawlers, but none found great success. Though the 1984 title, The Black Onyx, did find some among Japanese computer owners. That same year saw the release of games that attempted to integrate some of the language of RPGs into gameplay styles popular in the East. The maze genre was a huge hit, and Namco wanted to innovate it by adding action and role-playing tropes. In the Tower of Druaga, the hero Gilgamesh must scale a 60-floor maze-built tower to rescue the Maiden Kai and defeat the evil Druaga. The technology in use was the Namco Super Pac-Man arcade hardware. Combat had you hold out your sword and utilized bumping mechanics. As the name implies, damage is dealt through bumping. While the game is considered a grandfather to action RPGs, it mostly contains concepts associated with RPGs and not true RPG concepts themselves. However, there is no doubt that the game was influential on the subgenre's early years. Namco additionally was aware of the popularity of side-scrolling platformers and wished to innovate them as well. Dragon Buster, also first released in arcades, featured a prince named Clovis who must rescue his sister from an evil dragon. The game had you hack and slash through a variety of monsters in caves, mountains, towers, boneyards, and ruins. It featured a variety of pathways between levels and platforming through complex level design. It was one of the earliest titles to use a double jump mechanic. Most importantly, it introduced dungeon crawling and extremely light RPG ideas like a HP bar to side-scrolling games. Much like Tower of Draga, you can argue that this game includes many concepts associated with RPGs combined with action gaming, rather than being a true RPG itself. But like that game, it would be influential on the near future of action RPGs. Japanese developers were interested in experimenting with the top-down action-adventure style, which brings us to Nihon Falcom's Dragon Slayer for the PC-88, which boasted itself as a real-time role-playing adventure, and is often considered the first true action RPG. The game contained the most basic stats, HP, MP, and strength, which increased as you gained experience points. It was a dungeon crawler where you had to master the area's layout and find treasure. Much of the game's early grind is in finding gems that give you a lot of experience points. The combat was done through bumping mechanics, but unlike Druaga, the bumping was a battle of numbers with all kinds of stats being calculated where you and the enemy traded damage upon contact. T&E would develop Hydelight, 
first released on PCs, it featured a simple story about an evil man who stole one of three magic jewels, which allowed the vicious Morales to escape and transform the Princess Anne into three fairies whom the hero Jim must find. Jim must search the map, defeat enemies, overcome puzzles, discover items to progress, and find the fairies. The game was notoriously difficult and extremely grindy as you must defeat a ton of enemies to level up. Mechanics include an attack mode and defense mode where the former raised your attack but lowered your defense and the latter did the opposite. Combat was again done through bumping. Additional abilities include regenerating health and MP, as well as a quick save option. Highlight is considered in Japan to be hugely influential in the lineage of gaming. However, because it was not ported to the West until the late 80s, when bumping mechanics were already considered archaic, it garnered negative reactions. The reputation is not entirely without merit, since the game has aged very poorly. Though I am sure at this point people are surprised to find that bumping mechanics were not exclusive to Highlight, but were indicative of gaming as a whole at the time. The aforementioned games were a variety of titles with basic RPG mechanics. The key year, however, was 1985. A few developers tried their hands at making games similar to the ones we just mentioned, such as Courageous Perseus for the MSX, which had top-down exploration, simple stats, and of course, bumping mechanics. And there were a few games I found in my research that had long been considered to be RPGs but were really action-adventure titles. Rambo and Mark and Vale are the best examples. Both games were most likely mistaken for RPGs for the same reason The Legend of Zelda would be for so long, which was that they shared the top-down action gameplay style as well as other elements which were being seen more and more often in RPGs of the time, and people have had yet to correct the outdated information in these sources. Another noteworthy title is The Streamer, a futuristic cyberpunk game. Gameplay is similar to the first-person dungeon crawlers of the time, but the combat would suddenly thrust you into a side-scrolling shooter situation. The real stars of 1985, however, were Xanadu, Dragon Slayer 2, and Hyde Light 2. The second Dragon Slayer title was ahead of its time, and may as well be considered the first true archetypal action RPG. Your adventure begins with your avatar, both broke and weak, in a large booming town. A visit to the king allows you to name your characters, and he bestows some money upon you, which you must use to visit various facilities that act as stat distribution for your character. After that, you must venture into the caverns beneath the city, which contain ten stratums, all containing a complex system of caves, buildings, and boss fights. Xanadu is well known for having easy-to-get-used-to keyboard controls, though movement is choppy as your character can only move a single tile at a time. When you enter combat or enter a building, it shifts to a top-down perspective. Combat phases begin whenever you encounter an enemy. Much like its predecessor, the game's combat is a stat-heavy bumping encounter. Fighting nets you experience points, though you have both a fighter level and a magic level, which both gain separate experience points depending on if you use physical attacks or use your magic. Level ups occur when you return to the temple, and you have enough experience points in one of the two areas. Managing equipment such as weapons and armor became a major part of gameplay, and all equipment had their own experience levels. Your character has a karma level. Caves contain both good and bad monsters, and killing good monsters raises your karma. If it is too high, the minister can refuse to give you a level up, which can only be fixed by drinking a black poison bottle, which deals you damage equal to half your current HP. That last part doesn't make much sense, but I suppose they wanted some kind of punishment for the player. You also have a food meter, which allows your HP to regenerate. Running out of food will cause your health to drop rapidly. Xanadu in many ways represents the future of the subgenre, and sold 400,000 copies in Japan. Expansion packs would be released as time went on, making it one of the first games to receive such support. Hide Light 2 Shrine of Darkness debuted the same year for a variety of Japanese computers. The player is summoned from Earth to venture into Fairyland to destroy an evil crystal. The beginning contained character creation mechanics, where you could distribute points between steps. The basics of combat are similar to the first, though you can no longer attack in defense mode. The ability to purchase equipment has also become a part of the game. 
Leveling up now only increases HP, while money must be spent at training facilities to increase strength and magic. Increasing strength includes a minigame where better results equals better gains. While this is all interesting, it does mean more grinding will be necessary to gain more money. Health regeneration is back, however, if you stand still in a desert, forest, or graveyard, it causes health to go down instead, which is somewhat frustrating. The game now has an alignment system, split into justice, normal, and evil, with attacking people causing you to become more evil. And becoming more evil means that townsfolk won't talk to you anymore. Hide Light 2 is certainly a more ambitious game larger in scope and more detailed in its design, though it's still an unpolished product. At this point, the conclusion can be drawn from all of this. The archetypal Japanese action RPG debuted a year before the archetypal Japanese console-style RPGs. Dragon Quest would not be released until 1986. The history of RPGs, as I mentioned before, is somewhat more complex compared to the accepted narrative. We'll return to Dragon Quest influence in a moment, but for now, we shall cover 1986's action role-playing entries. Tritorn was a simple side-scrolling RPG. Super Tritorn was released later that year and continued the formula. 1986 would give way to two infamously bad action titles with RPG elements. The first being Deadly Towers, a poorly programmed game with very little to no direction or conveyance. The second is a very well-known Kusage, a Japanese word signifying an extremely terrible game. This one named Ganso Sayuki, Super Monkey Daiboken. It's a really boring RPG slash survival game based on the famous Chinese tale Journey to the West. Nihon Falcon put out yet another Dragon Slayer game, but this time shifted perspectives to a side-scrolling RPG entitled Romancia, Dragon Slayer Jr. The RPG elements have been scaled back tremendously. The karma system is still there, but this time you have to do good deeds in order to raise your karma. The game is very clumsy, the main character doesn't control very well, and the caves can be annoying. The game lacks much in the way of conveyance, and they had to include a manga to give the players an idea of what to do. Also, the game has a 30-minute time limit, and on top of that, it's very easy to find yourself in an unwinnable state. Probably the most interesting 1986 release was Wibarn, made by Arsis Software for Computers. In the future, even after a horrific nuclear war, humanity continues to build weapons. A rebellion has overrun Government City, and the monsters have taken advantage. You pilot the Wibarn, a Macross Valkyrie-style unit, which can switch between jet, tank, and walking mode. The open overworld navigated like a 2D side-scroller while interiors utilized 3D polygonal graphics. The 3D was unprecedented, allowing full 360-degree movement and even a competent shadow under the player unit. Encountering enemies took you to a separate side view with run-and-gun shooter mechanics. Defeating enemies earned you experience points known as units, and players could upgrade his mecha's equipment throughout the game. Web Arm would become popular among American techies as well, with the MS-DOS release years later. As we move on to 1987, we enter a strange turning point for RPGs in general. Firstly, as mentioned earlier, the history of the genre is rather complex. Further adding to it was the role of Dragon Quest debut. Dragon Quest, made by Enix, was the first archetypal Japanese console-style RPG, and it sold up to 1.5 million units. You would think that the reaction of businesses would be to switch focus. In fact, the prevailing wisdom is that console-style RPGs took over the market. While Dragon Quest became one of the most popular franchises in Japan, and while it is true the new subgenre was high in demand, that doesn't mean releases of that kind of game came out in mass. The mentality of developers went as follows. Action games sold well, RPGs are now selling well. If we combine them, we should be able to create a blockbuster. This is a list of the console-style RPGs that came out in 1987, the year following Dragon Quest's release. This is a list of the action RPGs that came out in 1987. Just to show the difference in production, this is a list of the action RPGs made in 1986. And once again, here is the list of 1987's titles. Secondly, I want to turn our attention to an action-adventure game that is not a RPG, The Legend of Zelda. For our purposes, I simply want to point out one mechanic that became important to the future of RPGs the stabbing animation. Now, Zelda technically was not the first to do this, but it was the most influential and was the game that sparked change. Today, we take for granted the visual cue and the sense of feedback we get from hitting an enemy. 
In 1986, believe it or not, this was a monumental achievement. In fact, you'd be surprised just how long it took for developers to adopt this idea. We would be here forever if we covered every 1987 action RPG, but there are a few noteworthy entries that reflected the era. The Sword of Kaelin was a basic action RPG of the time with your usual trappings and separate battle screens and showed that not all developers were ready to embrace what Zelda brought them. However, games like King Kong 2, Yomigeru Denetsu believed you should at least put some kind of effort into showing a stab animation. The magic of Scheherazade, which brought us to Arabia and allowed a choice of one of three Arabian classes, was an agreement about swords having actual animations. Scheherazade is also known for being one of the first comedic RPGs with its charming dialogue. Strangely enough, the game occasionally includes some turn-based combat. Unfortunately, it has been implemented into the game very poorly. The Ash Green series, which all had three titles apparently released the same year, were a variety of action games with leveling up systems and RPG exploration. The first release developed by BitSquared was a side-scrolling RPG. Story 2 by TNE Soft was a vertical scrolling hack and slash, while Story 3 by Microcabin was more in line with the top down RPGs of the time. Even Nintendo played their hand by having Zelda's sequel, much like Dragon Slayer and others before it, shift to being a side scroller. Zelda 2 contained a unique experience system where collecting enough points would allow you to upgrade either your health, magic bar, or strength, with more points being required for higher level upgrades. Towns functioned as they did in an RPG where you could gather information to learn where to go next. As opposed to the original Zelda, which had a single unified art style, the sequel with its top-down overworld and side-scrolling sections for towns and dungeons is absolutely Shigeru Miyamoto's take on what the 80s had to offer. Rambo makes a reappearance here, this time on the NES with a game based on Rambo First Blood Part 2. The build of the game is suspiciously similar to Zelda 2. Unfortunately, it controls nowhere as well and the game can be very directionless. Experience points all go towards your knife level, which can make it the most dangerous weapon in the game. Castlevania 2 included elements found in the RPGs of the time as well, including an experience system, a world map, purchasable better weapons, and townsfolk who you could gather information from. Golvelius was a Zelda-style action game released on the MSX and later the Master System that had both top-down and side-scrolling dungeons. Upgrades included permanent health and money increases. Experimentation was a huge part of the times as well. Artelius tells the story of an advanced space civilization sucked into a black hole and into another dimension known as Artelius, ruled by the evil King Sarbalor. The opening allows you to distribute and modify the stats of a cyborg before being released into a top-down adventure. Entering enemy encounters shifts the perspective into a first-person space shooter. Zoids, Chuao Tairuki no Tatakai was similar in nature. Based on the popular Japanese toy line, Zoids had you navigating much of the game in one form of gameplay, but when your Zoid encounter another, you would engage enemies in first person. One of Konami's early experiments was Esper Dream, which had traditional RPG elements and had you enter a separate battle screen when you entered encounters, but it also had a few differences from the norm. Your main characters were armed with bombs and guns. The game took place in modern times, and the MP bar was replaced with an EP bar for Esper points, which allowed you to use psychic attacks. Shiryu Sensen War of the Dead feels like an ancestor to Parasite Eve. Lila, a member of a paranormal military unit, is sent with her squad to Shaney Falls, where otherworldly creatures have invaded. Exploration of the town and buildings has a top-down perspective, with many menu-based functions similar to Dragon Quest. Random Encounters brings you to a side view where you rely on your guns and knife. Lila has a psychic gauge. The higher it is, the higher her defenses. She can also use her powers to increase the damage of her weapons. The remakes would add even more RPG elements, such as a more complex leveling system. And of course, it simply would not be the 80s if we did not have yet another Hydlide. Hydlide 3, known as Super Hydlide in its later Genesis port, introduces a class system where you can be a fighter, thief, monk, or cleric. 
the bumping mechanics and attack and defense mode were dropped in favor of the Zelda Revolution. The morality meter is back, though it functions a bit differently, and there are now survival mechanics in that each day is broken up into 24 hours. You have to eat twice a day as well as sleep. Much of the game feels like an overall improvement, and it has probably aged the least out of the entire franchise. Of course, Nihon Falcom was hard at work on their beloved Dragon Slayer franchise. Dragon Slayer 4, Drassel Family, known better in the West as Legacy of the Wizard, was a massive side-scrolling RPG. The Wards and Family are the descendants of a wizard who slayed a dragon, and now they must take up their legacy's calling, as the ancient dragon Kila is about to awaken. The beast's location is gigantic, that may as well be next to convoluted in the dictionary. In order to locate the Four Crowns and find the Dragon Slayer's sword, you must play as five characters. The father, wife, son, daughter, and pet monster, who have various pros and cons, and can only equip certain weapons each. You must navigate one portion of the dungeon, find special items, figure out what character can use them, then travel to other areas to use them in Metroidvania style. Later in 1987, Dragon Slayer V Sorcerian would be released and is one of the most advanced games of its time, especially compared to Dragon Slayer IV. You create a party of four characters, you choose their race, class, sex, and even occupation which decides how they'll earn their money over time. You can manipulate bonus points for stats, and even their age if you'd like, with portraits changing depending on how old they are. Characters can be trained in certain skills, and equipment can be infused with elements. Since both take time, you have the option to advance time as well. The magic system is one of the deepest and complex of its time. The adventure is non-linear, with 15 major quests that can be played in any order. Gameplay is side-scrolling, with you controlling all four characters at once, a first for its time. Falcom gave Hudson Soft development of a side-scrolling RPG that would act as a side story to Xanadu. Known as Fa Xanadu for the Nintendo Famicom, much like Xanadu, you start with nothing, but the king calls you the last hope, and gives you money to pay for your training to get your stats ready, and so you can buy equipment. However, the title Nihon Falcon would produce that would be most remembered from that year was Ease, Ancient Ease Vanished, the first game in one of Japan's longest running franchises. Ease features Adolf Kristen, who is looking to decipher the mystery behind a floating continent that vanished long ago. RPG elements include a level up system, equipment, and special magic rings. Ease used bumping mechanics, but you did damage by ramming enemies at high speeds. There was also a measure of strategy involved, where you had to hit enemies off-center, or from the sides or back to avoid taking damage. The fast pace, the impact giving necessary feedback, and strategy made it far more satisfactory than normal bumping mechanics, which is probably what helped launch the franchise's popularity, and what made it one of the only bumping games to have aged well. 1987 was a key year for role-playing. Not only did we receive Dragon Quest II, Final Fantasy, and Fantasy Star, but it was huge for Dragon Slayer, Zelda II, Ease, and others. However, only a handful of titles managed to stand the test of time. Even though the archetypal action RPG appeared before the archetypal console style, why did the latter come to dominate the former to the point that all we have discussed here is actually obscure as opposed to well known? The answer, of course, is the market. The Japanese people loved Dragon Quest and the kind of gameplay it brought them, and they loved Zelda as an action game, and they loved Mario as a platformer. Games that combined these styles did well, but not well enough. The country was excited by what turn-based RPGs had brought them, and that was what they wanted more of. The Japanese people chose to vote with their wallets. The developers in turn understood this and scaled back. Once again, here is the list of 1987's action RPGs. But now, here is the list for 1988. Now, this is what the subgenre's output looked like in 1990. This isn't to say that action role-playing disappeared, however. What this merely meant is that Japan wanted it in moderation. The late 80s brought with it some interesting titles, a few of which we can point out. In 1988, Ease 2 The Final Chapter was released. It was significantly larger than the first game. Added to the first game's mechanics was a magic system and an MP bar, the most noteworthy spell being Transform, 
which allowed you to converse with enemies. XZR, a game that switched between an overhead and side-scrolling perspective, was where you played as Sadler, a Syrian assassin who must eliminate his targets. Rather than herbs and potions, Sadler used drugs and narcotics. The end had you time travel to the late 80s, where you assassinated the General Secretary of the Soviet Union and the President of the United States. XZR2 would release later in 1988 and would be localized as Exile. Sadler now works to unite the world in peace through assassination, and at the end, once again travels to modern times to fight skateboarding punks. That same year, we would get Famicom Jump Hero Ritsuden. You played an original character who had to gather together heroes from shonen anime, such as Goku from Dragon Ball and Kinshiro from Fist of the North Star, to battle an alliance of villains from various anime. Arsis Software, the creators of Wibarm, created Star Cruiser, a first-person shooter with role-playing elements that contains space flight simulator gameplay when exploring outer space. Much like Wibarm, the game was praised for its use of 3D polygonal graphics. Also worth noting is the game's extended use of detailed story and character dialogues. 1989 contained a few titles that were noteworthy. Ease 3, like so many franchises before it, would experiment with side-scrolling. The infamous Famicom version of Willow, a top-down adventure RPG, was released. Dungeon Explorer was a class-based multiplayer RPG that supported up to five players. Little Ninja Brothers, known in Japan as Super Chinese 2, was the third, yes third, game in the popular Super Chinese series, but was the first to introduce RPG elements, from which future titles in the series would follow suit. The Super Chinese games are worth mentioning if just for being among the first top-down action RPGs to include jumping mechanics, and for its unique setting among role-playing games. Hisat's Daiju Yoburi was unique, for rather than being about swords and monsters, it was a karate-based RPG. At this point I hope that I have painted a portrait of what this era had looked like. But as I mentioned, it was around this time that action RPGs relented in favor of turn-based titles. In late 1989, a Dragon Slayer spin-off entitled Dragon Slayer, The Legend of Heroes was released. However, this was not an action RPG, but a turn-based game in the vein of what was in demand at the time, and would become the portion of the Dragon Slayer franchise that would endure to this day. The era of the Super Famicom saw the console-style turn-based RPG enter into a golden age. One could say a double shift had occurred. Early Western RPGs desired to create a Dungeons & Dragons-like experience. Japanese companies were looking to release games with wide appeal to people who didn't experience D&D, which allowed developers to add RPG elements to real-time games. During the late 80s and into the 90s, the double shift had the West move towards action RPGs and games with point-and-click mechanics, while Japan would shift focus to turn-based games. While their numbers would dwindle, as I mentioned before, this didn't mean the action RPG disappeared. The Ease franchise would continue to grow. Dragon Slayer had a few more action titles, as well as remakes. The Seiken Denetsu series, known here in America as the Mana series, would debut in 1991. The Gaia Trilogy would debut in the 90s as well, and the PS1 graced us with great games such as Parasite Eve and Brave Fencer Musashi. During the 2000s, the demand for action role-playing games increased, and they have enjoyed a larger place in Japan's market, with certain titles and franchises becoming very well received. The history of RPGs is a complex one filled with very divergent twists and turns down many different roads. I created this video to shed some light on this long enduring saga. The 80s was a period of rapid experimentation within many video game genres and role playing games were no exception. During the time, we see a very intricate collection of top-down and side-scrolling RPGs. We would see top-down exploration and side-scrolling combat, but would also see transitions for exploration and combat using everything else in between. The concept of taking on a role and improving the abilities and powers of your character was never limited to just swinging a sword and limited to one gameplay style. Hopefully, this video will go a long way in more clearly defining the history of a genre that has a past as complex as what it means to roleplay itself.
I hope you all enjoyed this episode of the History of RPGs. Next time, we take a closer look at Ease, Ancient Ease Vanished. Thank you for watching, and God bless you all.